Hi, this is Jules. Um, here's another little video about, um, this one's about how philosophy can offer some ideas uh, and uh, tips for coping with isolation, um, with imprisonment and confinement. So a lot of philosophers, um, ancient and modern, um, were put in prison and thought about how philosophy can help them when they were deprived of their uh, normal comforts and normal way of life. So Socrates, of course, was put on trial by the people of Athens and imprisoned. Um, Boethius uh, famously wrote a, a great book called The Consolations of Philosophy when he was imprisoned. Um, Epictetus was uh, imprisoned. Uh, he was a slave in the Roman Empire and he was exiled twice. And his book, uh, Discourses, is a wonderful little book and has lots of tips on how to kind of cope with uh, adversity. Uh, Seneca, uh, likewise, and uh, St. Paul, and those are just some examples. So they thought a lot about it. So here are some um, ideas uh, from philosophy. So the first tip is to find role models from history, literature, and film. One of the people I interviewed uh, for my first book, Philosophy for Life and Other Dangerous Situations, was Louis Ferrante. And Louis was a mobster in the New York Mafia. Uh, and he was arrested when he was 21 and sent to prison for 10 years. And while he was in prison, he uh, really fell out of love with the mobster life. He became very disillusioned with it. Uh, and he tried to start um, bettering himself. And he taught himself how to read. And he started to read the biographies of impressive people from history. Louis says, I fell in love with reading biographies, reading about people who had achieved amazing things in their life against the odds, people who had surmounted all obstacles, and they're human beings. Churchill was just a man like me. You have to realize all circumstances might be against you, but the same God that created you created Churchill, Newton, Einstein. Louis was particularly inspired by Nelson Mandela's long walk to freedom. I was serving eight and a half years, and Mandela was inside 20 something years just to liberate his country. He could serve triple what I was serving because he had a goal. So we can find stories of endurance, of survival, of heroism, of people coping with um, real hardship. And, and that can help us to bear the load that we're bearing at the moment. So I spoke to my dad this week and he was watching The Cruel Sea. So that, he's going back to these kind of World War II Navy stories. Uh, and earlier this week, um, I watched the, uh, the movie, the documentary Touching the Void uh, about um, a man surviving on a mountain with a broken leg for, um, for a few days. Uh, and, and, and these kind of stories can help us because they can put um, our situation in perspective. Um, we are looking at, uh, you know, several weeks of confinement, but, but, you know, in perspective, that's quite a short stretch. If you think about um, Nelson Mandela serving uh, 27 years. So that brings me on to my next point. Um, use uh, confinement and deprivation to learn self-government. So Nelson Mandela was imprisoned for life when he was 44, when he arrived at Robben Island Prison, the guards said to him, you're gonna die here. He ended up serving uh, 27 years in there, came out an old man. And yet he says that that period of confinement really helped him to grow and mature and develop. The journalist Richard Stengel, the editor of Time Magazine, uh, interviewed Mandela for uh, The Long Walk to Freedom. Um, and he says um, that uh, prison was Mandela's great teacher. It burned away a lot of his character, a lot of the youthful impulsiveness and recklessness, and taught him incredible self-control, because in prison that was all he could control. There was no room for outbursts or self-indulgence or lack of discipline. In prison, Mandela also learned to master self-control. I recall when news was given to him that his mother had died, news was given to him that his son, Tembi, had died. I think that Madiba understood the enormous self-control that was required of him. He pulled through that and survived them very well. 
which was a lesson to us as well, so that subsequently when we uh, heard about deaths from our own homes, you know, we, we thought, uh, well, it's, it's happened to him as well, and so he was able to deal with it. We should be able to deal with it as well. The long, dark years Mandela spent behind bars were filled with pain and deprivation. But it was also a time for profound reflection and growth. He overcame the bad and developed that which was good in him. He didn't break. Instead, he found the strength to rise above the bitterness. So it's uh, so Mandela learned this stoic idea of when you're in adversity, when you're in a situation where there's a lot you can't control, you can still really focus and practice autonomy and sovereignty by focusing on what you can control. Um, and he was quite inspired by um, this poem Invictus, this famous Victorian stoic poem, which goes, um, out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody, but unbound. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shame. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. So what we can learn from Mandela is the importance of having a routine of um, exercising properly every day, of eating properly, of keeping our uh, living space tidy, and of taking the time to educate ourselves as well. Um, the uh, Mandela and his inmates uh, used to call Robben Island the university behind bars. They all taught themselves to read. They all studied Shakespeare and philosophy and politics and law. Uh, so again, let's, let's see if we can um, use this situation to educate ourselves as well. I don't know if this is a philosophical technique, but it's definitely one that I've found useful in my uh, 20 years of self-employment. So as I said earlier this week, I was watching the documentary Touching the Void, and it's about this mountaineer, Joe Simpson, who uh, whilst climbing a mountain in Peru, falls and breaks his leg and somehow manages to survive over the next three or four days. And the way that Joe says he survived is he sets himself a goal of, right, I'm gonna get to that next uh, bit of the mountain within 20 minutes. And he pulls himself along and then looks at his watch to see if he's made that goal. And he keeps on setting himself goals like that. And that's really how he survived and stops himself from completely falling apart. And in many ways, being self-employed and working from home is like surviving on a icy mountain with a broken leg. You need uh, goals and targets. Otherwise, you can lose yourself on the glacier of aimlessness. So um, make a list of your, um, of your aims for that day and, uh, and tick them off. And when you've achieved your goals for the day, then relax. An important thing about working from home and about self-employment is to have a clear line between your work time and your off work time, because it's not like you're going to the office and then coming back. So you need to be clear, I've got what I needed to get done today. Um, another philosopher um, here in Bristol, Julian uh, Bagini, did a great uh, tweet yesterday The fourth tip is to have mercy on yourself and on others. So I've been reading Daniel Defoe's book, uh, Journal of uh, a Plague Year. Uh, and he, um, he's talking about the 1665 plague in London, the bubonic plague, which killed 50% um, of everyone who got it. And uh, Defoe, uh, it's a fictional book, but he says that um, one of the things that happened to people was their hearts became hardened and so against that, really, the challenge is to try and keep our hearts open and in some sense uh, to keep our hearts soft during uh, adversity. Uh, and a great teacher for that is uh, Pema Chodron, who I, I mentioned in my last video, the um, American uh, Tibetan Buddhist teacher. 
Um, so on the first chapter, she says, um, when I was six years old, I received the essential bodhicitta teaching from an old woman sitting in the sun. Bodhicitta means um, having an open heart, basically. I was walking by her house one day, feeling lonely, unloved and mad, kicking anything I could find. Laughing, she said to me, little girl, don't go letting life harden your heart. Right there, I received this pith instruction. We can let the circumstances of our lives harden us so that we become increasingly resentful and afraid. Or we can let them soften us and make us kinder and more open to what scares us. We always have this choice. Wherever we are, we can train as a warrior. The practices of meditation, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity are our tools. Equanimity is being balanced in uh, very turbulent times. Bodhicitta training offers no promise of happy endings. Rather, this I who wants to find security, who wants something to hold on to, can finally learn to grow up. The central question of a warrior's training is not how we avoid uncertainty and fear, but how do we relate to discomfort? How do we practice with difficulty, with our emotions, with the unpredictable encounters of an ordinary day? So there will be moments in the weeks and months ahead when you will feel um, cranky and tired and grumpy and overwhelmed and you will be easily triggered uh, and you will snap and you will think I'm failing at this so have mercy on yourself have compassion for yourself and have compassion for the people around you that you are uh, confined with as well so, um, Aristotle says that a healthy society needs various mechanisms to help us shake off the tensions, the nervous tensions of civilization. So that could be um, exercise, walking, uh, having kind of a daily press up regime, Tai Chi, if you kind of go on YouTube and learn some very basic Tai Chi exercises, or yoga, just bouncing up and down or dancing. These are all ways of just shaking out the kind of nervous tension in our bodies. And the final tip is to find moments of joy, beauty and humour every day and then share them with others. So every day try and find at least one thing that really strikes you as beautiful. Uh, yesterday for me it was for example the magnolia tree outside our house which is in blossom and is just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and find moments of humour as well. So something that made me laugh yesterday was uh, uh, a friend posted some advice, I think genuinely on Facebook, which was that um, the virus uh, supposedly lives in our sinuses because it's cold. So one way to stop yourself getting the virus was to, um, to blow a um, hairdryer up your nose uh, and that would stop you getting it. So little things like that uh, make me laugh. And just to see us out, um, I'm gonna show you a, a famous clip from a movie about finding a moment of beauty in confinement. You can sign up for my weekly newsletter to get uh, my uh, weekly videos and essays. Uh, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, my website's philosophyforlife.org. Uh, and you can uh, find the books I've written there as well. I guess uh, for this time, uh, particularly philosophy for life and other dangerous situations uh, might be a useful one. That's about how you can use stoicism in everyday life. So um, keep well, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you next week. Did you hear that?
I have no idea to this day what those two Italian ladies were singing about. Truth is, I don't want to know. Some things are best left unsaid. I like to think they were singing about something so beautiful it can't be expressed in words and makes your heart ache because of it. I tell you, those voices soared higher and farther than anybody in a great place dares to dream. It was like some beautiful bird flapped into our drab little cage and made those walls dissolve away. And for the briefest of moments, every last man at Shawshank felt free.